Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone. I am Kim Rosen. I'm the founder of the She College Fund, and we welcome each one of you to this gathering at the hearth of poetry and music. I thank you for the warmth of your presence here around the fire, and I thank you for your donations, which have already made this a successful fundraiser for the SHE Fund, even before we've begun. And I especially want to thank these artists who are here with me on screen, Danusha Lamaris, Jamie Sieber, Jane Hirschfield, Marie Howe, Ellen Bass, and Janine Roth. Thank you so much. Did I forget anyone? <laughs> I hope not. Um, huge thanks to each one of you. Each one of you has shown up for, for the She College Fund students from the minute I started this work and I could not have done it without you and all the other people who have supported me. We also have very two very important guests of honor with us tonight, um, who I will introduce to you later. They are Jacinta Metier, who was the first SHE student ever and is now the executive director of the SHE Fund of Kenya, and Salula Nangisa, who is currently a student at Daystar University. You'll get to meet them later. I want to say it's an especially potent blessing to gather at this time when the airwaves are rife with the news of escalating conflict and suffering in Palestine, Israel, Ukraine, and in many other zones of humanitarian crisis throughout the world. And I offer up my own prayer that as we give our voices, our resources and our love to ending oppression and violation of women and girls in Kenya. May this serve the transformation of these currents everywhere within us and around us. I love the name of this event from tribe and fire, which is a phrase from Danusha's poem small kindnesses. Here are a few more lines of the poem. We have so little of each other now, so far from tribe and fire. Only these brief moments of exchange. What if they are the true dwelling of the holy, these fleeting temples we make together? May this gathering be such a fleeting temple where in holy moments brought on by words and music, we find ourselves opened beyond our separate skins into a sudden kinship, which happens to be the root of the word kindness, as this poem is so aptly titled, small kindnesses, small kinships. Kindness means not only caring or service to others, though that abounds here for sure, but etymologically goes back to family, roots, race, oneness, kinship. Many of you know that the She College Fund was born of such a moment, a fleeting temple built by a poem in which I and a group of 50 Maasai girls found themselves, ourselves in an unexpected kinship and the kindness from that moment has continued to this day. I had just arrived at the V-Day safe house in Kenya for girls, for girls who had said no to FGM, female genital mutilation and early forced childhood marriage. They had left everything they'd ever known behind at the age of 10, 8, 14 to find refuge and to get an education, which is something that is denied to females in their tribe. They were now clustered around me, waiting for me to say something. I was completely tongue-tied, totally intimidated by what seemed like an unbridgeable gulf between us. I did the only thing I could do. I recited a poem. At the end of The Journey by Mary Oliver, we were all in tears. Jacinta and Salula, who are here tonight, were both in the 
room at the time. Jacinta stood right in front of me and she asked, who is this woman, Mary Oliver? Is she Maasai? Mm -hmm. No, I told her, she's a white woman like me, Mzungu. Jacinta looked at me incredulous. How did she know? In that moment of kinship, the seed of the She College Fund was sown. Let me go over a few technical details before we dive into the richness of this program. We chose the Zoom meeting where we could see each other, if you want, to give a greater sense of the very real community that has been rallied by these wonderful artists and this cause. You can toggle between gallery and speaker view on your own screen, and you're welcome to have your video on or off. The chat is on now, but it will be turned off as soon as the main program begins, and then we'll put it on again at the end. Um, but you will always be able to text to host Zoom host cat, who is the magician behind the scenes. So if you click on the chat and you need to ask her something, she's there. Um, you are all muted now and you can't unmute yourselves, but at the end we will ask you to unmute and uh, so that we can give uproarious applause. And after this formal offering, which should be about an hour and 45 minutes total, there will be two different gatherings, both at the same Zoom link. There's no other Zoom link that you need to know. There will be two different gatherings. Um, for those who would like to meet Jacinta and Salula and hear more about the She Fund, you'll just stay in this room. And there will be a patron gathering in a breakout room for anyone who has donated $100 or more and would like to go there. And this will be hosted by Janine Roth with the artists. I'm going to keep my introductions really short to make more time for the gifts that the artists are bringing. You can read their bios in the program that you received by email. I begin by welcoming Marie Howe. Truly, it's thanks to Marie that I am here today. I met her when I was a student at Sarah Lawrence doing my master's in poetry. And some great mystery has woven our lives together. It was Marie who reached out and invited me to go to Kenya with her and her then seven-year-old daughter, Inan, in 2006. If I had not had our little tribe of Marie, Inan, and Kim, I would never yeah. have had the courage to go beyond my comfort zone. When Marie and Inan headed home, I headed to the safe house, and the rest is history. Marie has been one of the great teachers of my life in so many ways, I cannot count them. Her poems save me again and again, and I'd like to go on and on about her and her poetry, but rather than that, I'll step back and just say that I have already pre-ordered your book, Marie, um, New and Selected Poems, which is to be released on April 2nd, and I'm counting the days. Welcome, Marie, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Kim. Um, it's a joy to be here. Can you all hear me? I hope um, I was just remembering when we were on that airplane flying, we, we stopped in London and Kim was doing something in London or somewhere. And she was supposed to get on our plane and um, there had been some delay uh, in her travel, her other flight. And we were waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And it seemed that they're about to close the door and Kim rushed onto the plane and Inan and I burst into cheers and we were off for our adventure to Africa, to Kenya. Um, this is the most important uh, fund. Um, I have to confess to you that I do sometimes go on Instagram to watch the elephants and to look at wolves and to see border collies um, do their work because it brings me so much joy. And just today, um, when I was feeling a little, uh, well, quite quite sad about the conflict in the world, I went on Instagram and the only thing I saw was um, a video of a, a jumbo, a large elephant 
um, elef it says that elephants have recently discovered, maybe they haven't recently, maybe they've always known, but that they can tear down an electrical fence with their tusks because the tusks um, mm -hmm. are not, are not they, they, they don't um, conduct the energy. And I watched this elephant pull down this electric fence and I thought, that's what the Chi Fund does. That's what it does. That's why we're here. It pulls down these fences in front of young women and it gives them an open field to walk across into their empowered lives so that they can become who they want to be. They can become empowered to find work that means something to them. And um, I just have this vision of this, this electrical fence um, coming down. So um, I hope all of us can give as much as we can to this fund. It goes directly to girls. They they go to school, it's paid for, um, and it changes their lives. I wanna read, um, if there's time, there's three poems, sort of about the planet, postscript. What we did to the earth, we did to our daughters, one after the other. What we did to the trees, we did to our elders stacked in their wheelchairs by the lunchroom door. What we did to our daughters, we did to our sons calling out for their mothers. What we did to the trees, what we did to the earth, we did to our sons, to our daughters. What we did to the cow, to the pig, to the lamb, we did to the earth, butchered and milked it. Few of us knew what the bird calls meant or what the fires were saying. We took of earth and took and took, and the earth seemed not to mind until one of our daughters shouted, it was right in front of you, mom, right in front of your eyes, and you didn't see. The air turned red. The ocean grew teeth. Mm -hmm. um, during the, the long pandemic, when so many of us were at home um, or somewhere uh, enclosed and kept from each other, um, I kept thinking about if the virus had a voice or what the earth would say to us um, who were finally silenced a little bit, maybe, maybe quieted down enough to listen. Um, excuse me. And... Um, this is what this is what came this voice what the earth seemed to say do you still believe in borders birds soar over your maps and walls and always have you might have watched how the smoke from your own fire traveled on wind you couldn't see wafting over the valley and up and over the hills and over the next valley and the next hill did you not hear the animals howl and sing or hear the silence of the animals no longer howling? Now you know what it is to be afraid. You think this is a dream? It is not a dream. You think this is a theoretical question? What do you love more than what you imagine is your singular life? The water grows clearer. The, swan, the swans settle and float there. Are you willing to take your place in the forest again, to become loam and bark, to be a leaf falling from a great height, to be the worm who eats the leaf and the bird who eats the worm? Look at the sky. Are you willing to be the sky again? You think this lesson is too hard for you. You want the time out to end. You want to go to the movies as before, to sit and eat with your friends. It can end now, but not in the way you imagine. You know the mind that has been talking to you for so long, the mind that can explain everything. Don't listen. You were once a citizen of a country called I Don't Know. Remember the boat that brought you there? It was your body. 
climb in. And uh, I've been asking the, the beautiful writers I work with to try to imagine something that hasn't happened yet. And um, I was influenced by a beautiful poem by Derek Walcott called The Season of Phantasmal Peace. Um, and it's hard to do that, but um, over time, this poem, this I began to actually hear this. So I'm gonna read it, I think for the first time, maybe in public, um, it's called Him. Him. It began as an almost inaudible hum, low and long for the solar winds and far dim galaxies, a hymn growing louder for the moon and the sun, a song without words for the snow falling, for snow conceiving snow, conceiving rain, the rivers rushing without shame, the hum turning again higher into a riff of ridges, peaks hard as consonants, summits and praise for the rocky faults and crust and crevices, then down, down to the roots and rocks and burrows and the lake's skittery surfaces, wells, oceans, breaking waves, the salt deep, warm bodies moving within it, the cold deep underneath gleaming. Some of us rising as the planet turned into dawn, some lying down as it turned into dark. As each of us rested, another woke, standing among the cast off cartons and automobiles. We left the factories and stood in the parking lots, left the subways and stood on the sidewalks, in the bright offices, in the cluttered yards, in the farmed fields, in the mud, of the shanty towns, breaking into harmonies we'd not known possible, finding the chords as we found our true place, singing in a million, million keys, the human hymn of praise for every something else there is and ever was and will be, the song growing louder and rising. Listen, I too believed it was a dream. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. Um, I can hardly talk, but thank you so much, Marie. Poetry as spell, poetry as incantation. Thank you. Yeah. Whew. During the pandemic, Kenya's schools shut down for eight months and all the she students had to go home. This created a dire situation, not only because of the poverty and even starvation that they faced, but also because being at school protected them for the most part from FGM, marriage, and early pregnancies. Thanks to the incredible generosity of our funders, many of whom, many, many of whom are here right now, we were not we were able not only to support our students during that time, but also to support their families so that instead of becoming victims in their villages, they became models and sources of inspiration and support. They sent us thank you videos from their whole families. The, the family behind me is a screenshot from one of those videos. One student, Lena, went far beyond what she could do with her smartphone and got together with some film students from her university. They created an amazing 20 minute film about her life and the importance of the She College Fund in it. I've excerpted three two to four minute segments so that she can tell you better than I ever could about the She College Fund and the young woman, women it serves. Here is the first segment. My name is Lina Naisho, a beneficiary of She 
uh, studying at Masimara University. I'm coming from a village called Ncheishi at Majimoto Ward, Narok County. A lady, a Maasai lady with great ambition and great dreams. I have big dreams of the Ma girls and, come and giving back to my community. In my community, girls are being looked down upon than boys. Boys have greater privileges than, than girls. Girls go through early marriages, FGM, they drop out of school because of the hardship and big difficulties in the, in the village. My life is a story, a big story. I grew up in a village where girls are being, uh, going through difficult times. My life was so difficult because even the, the distance that I go to school, I go 16 kilometers a day. So it was so hard because the weather was just harsh. We don't have sweaters, warm clothes, we don't have shoes. So I just walk that long distance and the animals are there. I met with the lions and other, other uh, wild animals, but I thank God because all through, from class two to class six, I have been walking all those distances, but I didn't lose hope. Thank you, Lena. Thank you, thank you. That will be continued. When I first met Danusha Lamaris, she was a participant in a workshop that Jamie Sieber and I were giving in Santa Cruz. The only thing I remember about that workshop, <laughs> remember that? The only thing I remember was that at the end of it, Danusha said, the music is like an enzyme that delivers the poetry. I had no idea who she was at the time, but I have quoted that line in every one of the hundreds of workshops I've given since that day, and I should probably be paying you royalties, Danusha. <laughs> had I known her poetry, I would not have been surprised at such an exquisitely accurate metaphor. Since then, her poems have become my friends, teachers, mirrors, and sometimes beckonings into deeper self-honesty and realness on the page and in my life. Mm -hmm. I can hardly wait for her forthcoming book, Blade by Blade. Danusha, welcome. Thank you so much, Kim, and thank you everybody who's here supporting this event. And Kim, I have always been your biggest fan. That I remember that concert because it was just amazing seeing you do your incantatory magic and it is so good to be here now I'm, I'm more emotional than I usually am when I am uh, a presenter so <laughs> bear with me it's just such a great joy to be in a space where and I, I'm sitting here going this will someday be the news of the world I want to believe that that along with Marie's beautiful hymn that I want to believe that the news of people helping one another um, along their path and being collaborative and generous with one another and receptive um, and all of those things will be the true news of the future. So, and it is the news of this moment. Um, and I'm grateful to be a part of this. So thank you everyone for being here and attending to the She Fund and to all, all of this magic today. I like to sometimes start with a little, a little mini poem, and I'll be doing that now, a poem called The Heart Is Not. It's a pocket poem, meaning I wrote it for the New York Public Library so that people could carry it in their pockets. They have a number of poets um, write eight line poet poems. The heart is not a pocket, a thing that can be turned inside out, but by anybody's hand, not a place for pebbles or loose change, not to carry old receipts. It does not tear at the seam. It does not have a seam. It cannot be torn.
This next poem is called Inshallah, and I wrote it while I was in a state of waiting, uh, which many of us often are for some difficulty to pass or some blessing that we hope is to come. And I had come across this word Inshallah from Muslim friends of mine who spoke it. And I just think it carries so much, that word for, for all of us. Inshallah. I don't know when it slipped into my speech, that soft word meaning, if God wills it. Inshallah, I will see you next summer. The baby will come in spring, inshallah. Inshallah, this year, we will have enough rain. So many plans I've laid have unraveled easily as braids beneath my mother's quick fingers. Every language must have a word for this, a word our grandmothers uttered under their breath as they pinned the whites, soaked in lemon, hung them to dry in the sun, or peeled potatoes, dropping the discarded skins into a bowl. Our sons will return next month, inshallah. Inshallah, this war will end soon, inshallah. The rice will be enough to last through winter. How lightly we learn to hold hope. As if it were an animal that could turn around and bite your hand. And still we carry it the way a mother would, carefully from one day to the next. I think of Lena walking to school past lions. I was, that was my image, inshallah. That child will make it safely and did. Um, so yes, inshallah. Pardon me, turning my pages here. Um, I want to read a poem I wrote after a line by the wonderful poet and essayist um, a Native American woman, Linda Hogan. And um, she wrote an essay about being in conversation with a field of corn. It's in her book, Dwellings. If you haven't read that book, I highly recommend reading this book of essays. You can just pick one up and savor uh, one short essay at a time. And in that essay about the corn, she wrote the words, nothing wants to suffer. And my mind just started spiraling into that space of poem. And so here is that, Let me do a little sip of water. Nothing wants to suffer. Not the wind as it scrapes itself against the cliff. Not the cliff being eaten slowly by the sea. The earth does not want to suffer the rough tread of those who do not notice it. The trees do not want to suffer the ax, nor see their sisters felled by root rot, mildew, rust. The coyote in its den, the puma stalking its prey. These two want ease and a tender animal in the mouth to take their hunger, an offering one hopes made quickly and without much suffering. The chair mourns an angry sitter, the lamp, a scalded moth, a table, the weight of years of argument. We know this, though we forget. Not the shark, nor the tiger, fanged as they are, not the worm content in its windowless world of soil and stone, not the stone resting in its riverbed, the riverbed gazing up at the stars, least of all the stars ensconced in their canopy, looking down at all of us, their offspring, scattered so far beyond reach.
I was thinking too about how um, we're drawn to the things we can't quite have or can't quite see, how curiosity makes us love a thing. Um, you know, when you get those scratchers where you're supposed to scratch off and reveal if you won a thing, I guess, I guess those are lottery tickets. I don't know. Um, there's something, I mean, if the numbers were just showing and you opened an envelope and there they were, that's no fun. We want to scrape away at it and see that there's something hidden. Um, and I think we're drawn to that in so many places. Often we love best. Often we love best what is hidden, the locket, our initials etched entwined on the back, the wool coat's pink silk lining, the painting beneath a painting, its faint hills and far off church. Last month I bought a picture only to discover that when tipped to pour, it reveals a hidden message underneath. We love whatever is inscribed, whatever's whispered in the delicate shell of the ear. If not the forest, the idea of it, dense, impenetrable, like the face of someone whose thoughts we might try and fail to discern and whom therefore we desire. The lover whose kiss simmers on the back of the neck, but whose name we hold close to our breast. The privacy of the womb, its occupant a stirring beneath the palm. The holy grail because of its refusal to be found. Galaxies not yet seen, but guessed at, glimmering on the periphery of the universe. So why not the impossible to know? The shadowed days ahead, events only sketched on time's parchment, the fractured gift of age, its slow or quick diminishment, the last breath, and then after that. We're gonna love the unknown. <laughs> I'll read just one more brief poem. And again, I just am so grateful for the way all of you are contributing um, as the she students uh, yourselves and as the those who support um, the she fund are all participating in bringing more beauty and more grace to this world that can really, really use it. Um, and especially now. So here's a last um, poem about how we try to make some sense of things and um, usually fail. <laughs> it's called Nightbird. Hear me. Sometimes thunder is just thunder. The dog barking is only a dog. Leaves fall from the trees because the days are getting shorter, by which I mean not the days we have left, but the actual length of time, given the tilt of earth and distance from the sun. My nephew used to see a therapist who mentioned that at play, he sunk a toy ship and tried to save the captain. Not, he said, that we want to read anything into that. Who can read the world? It's paragraphs of cloud, and alphabets of dust. Just now, a night bird outside my window made a single plaintive cry that wafted up between the trees. Not, I'm sure, that it was meant for me. So thank you all. And thank you again, Kim, for including me in this event. It's such an honor and a pleasure to be here. Thank you, everyone. Danusha, thank you so much. I am slain by these poems. I am slain by them. Thank you for being here. And I feel with you like your poems are like chariots that carry some je ne sais quoi essence of you right oh. to our bloodstreams. And I'm super grateful for that. Thank you. <laughs> 
Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Janusha. And that thing looks great on you. I love it. Oh, it was made for I, you. I feel yeah. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. And to the people who made it, thank you. Yes, yes. Someone that just into our Salula may know. I know. <laughs> thank you. I have had the huge good luck to have been collaborating and soul diving with Jamie Sieber since April 17th, 2001 at approximately 12.010 p.m. <laughs> um, many of the ecstatic experiences of my life have taken place while reciting poems to your music. Most important. I would say in the last 22.5 years, we have plumbed the depths of true friendship. And as we age together, and we are what they call in Kenya, age mates. That means meeting loss, vulnerability, and letting go. The convergence of recent and current crises on our planet with our own aging process compelled us to create our most recent album together, which is entitled Feast of Losses a communion of grief and gratitude. It has poems by Marie, Ellen, and other of our favorite poets, all of the present company included. Um, the music Jamie created for these poems is unabashedly, I will say, the most beautiful music I've ever known. Um, Kat will put the link if you're interested in tracking down that album and Jamie, Thank you for being here again and again for the She Fund. Oh, hello, Kim. It is such an honor. I've been looking forward to this day. And I have to be honest, is I feel like words are escaping me right now, given the, the depth of the poems and the video and everything. So um, bear with me. Um, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you, Kim. Thank you everyone who is a part of She Fund. Um, we come here in celebration, and I also know that we also come with aching hearts right now. And um, this is the perfect place for us to be nourished. Um, I'm gonna do two pieces, uh, the first one being Me Nam, and the second piece being inspired by a yard full of roosters in um, Hawaii during one of Kim and Mai's Beyond Words workshop. Um, and uh, so those are the two pieces. They'll just segue into one another. And Mainam is the Thai word for river. And I invite us all down to the river, bringing our joys, our prayers, our sorrows. Welcome.
A big thank you to the brave girls and young women in Kenya. Thank you. You inspire us all. Thank you, everybody. May the roosters continue calling. <laughs> Wow, um, thank you so much, Jamie. That was incredibly beautiful. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Sylvia Otieno, and I'm an advisory board member for the She College Fund, and I'm also Kenyan American. The late Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. As a Kenyan, I've seen firsthand the challenges that women and girls go through, and I have a keen interest in helping address them. I'm lucky that the work of She College is allowing me to contribute in a small way to the efforts to educate our girls and so that they could change the world. I'm so excited to hear that we've raised $21,723 so far. And I'm even more excited because I know we can raise an additional $4,000 so that we can send another girl to school. One girl that got that benefited from the generosity of people like you is Lena. So I would like to hand it back to her. so She can tell us more about her story. Thank you. When I, I, I was growing up, uh, the time came when I was to go through FGM. It was 2006, uh, August, when we were to go through the cut, which is FGM. So when the time came, I was so, so down. I knew that my dream will be, uh, will be cut off. I know my education will be cut off. Everything will be shattered. So when, uh, when time came for us to go through the cut, I was so disturbed, I was so sad. So with God's help, I was rescued and I was taken to Tassaro Rescue Center at town. Tassaro Rescue Center helped me to go through primary and secondary school, so I, I have been there for all those years, from class six to form four. So after, after uh, form four, which is uh, after secondary education, before uh, she came in, I stayed at home for three years, uh, for two years, which is 2013 and 2014. I had nobody to to, to, to help me go through my, my university education. I almost lost hope because nobody will, will help me even to buy clothes, even to buy food. I'm just there. So with God's grace, we met with, we met with Kim Rosen, who is the founder of She Student, She, she Fan. And I thank God because at that time, we just met with her when I was almost losing hope, totally losing hope. But I thank God because of she. She came to me, she came in, and I saw that my dreams are coming alive again. Thank you so much, Lena. Thank you. Also, Sylvia, beautifully, beautifully presented. And Ellen, I'm so happy to be with you. Whenever I can be with you, I am so happy to be with you. It seems like I've known Ellen Bass forever, but in fact, Marie introduced us in 2011. But somehow I feel like you're part of my family, Ellen, and um, several of your poems are definitely part of my body because they are written on my bones, which is another way of saying learned by heart. 
And I'm sure that many of the people with us feel the same way about Ellen's work, because that is one of the many great gifts of your poems, a sense of belonging, of animal connection and kinship. Ellen has shaped my voice as a poet and as a speaker of poems through her writing and also through her stunning font of wisdom that pours into her online living room craft talks. There will be a new series starting in March. Welcome, Ellen. Thank you for being here again. Oh, thank you, Kim. Thank you, everyone who has um, shared so far. What a joyous celebration and like many of us it it comes at a, a, a important time that is so much suffering in the world and uh, in my small circle of family and friends so much suffering and death recently and it makes me so happy to be able to be here with all of you for an occasion that is so joyous and filled with so much hope. And there, there's so much that we can't do a, a great deal to ameliorate. And this is a place where we really can. And I, I encourage you uh, to, to please, if you're not already involved with the She Fund, to, to make a contribution if you at all can. It's, it's a place where everything matters as you hear so much, everything matters so much, and we actually can have some agency. And just thank you to all these brave, courageous young women um, who inspire me. I was thinking about what to read, and I thought that I would read some odes because it's a time when I need that um, praise, need to be reminded of the praise and uh, the joy. So here are a few odes. Ode to Fat. Tonight, as you undress, I watch your wondrous flesh that swelled again, the way a river swells when the ice relents. Sweet relief, just to regard the sheaves of your hips your boundless breasts and marshy belly. I adore the acreage of your thighs and praise the promising planets of your ass. Oh, you were lean that terrifying year you were unraveling, as though you were returning to the slender scrap of a girl I fell in love with. But your skin was vacant, a ripped sack, sugar spilling out, and your bones insistent. Oh, praise the loyalty of the body that labors to rebuild its palatial realm. Bless butter, bless brie, sanctify schmaltz and cream and cashews, stoke the furnace of the stomach and load the vessels. Darling, drench yourself in opulent oil, the lamp of your body glowing. May you always flourish enormous and sumptuous be marbled with fat, a great vault that I can enter, the cathedral where I pray. And this is another different poem that also has fat and grease in it, Ode to the Pork Chop. As oil blisters in the cast iron pan, my dog does adoring prostrations at my feet and the pale pink chops with their arc of rib and ribbon of fat lie innocently on the white bone china we bought at Macy's, where my wife asked the sales clerk what kind of bones the dishes were made from, and the woman confessed she had no idea, though surely they were crushed from sorrowful creatures. Everything you do will cause harm. So I start forgiving myself now. And this pig was a happy pig, and his death, though death, was good. I've boiled up his vertebrae, femurs, and fibula, his head and his hocks, and now the stock is cooling, the creamy lard rising to the top like a thick slab of heaven. When these choice cuts hit the skillet, 
the hiss and spit is a lullaby that soothed homo sapiens since the discovery of fire and lured the dogs into the circle, shoulders hunched toward the flames. As meat sears and butter bubbles, that sizzling tells us all will be well. The egg will be released from the ovary. The swaddled infant will suck. There will be mayhem and there will be bliss and stuffed into every cell of our bodies, that deep craving for grease. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, is an ode to um, a very, very dear dog who uh, I lived with for quite a lot of years. His name was Zeke, and this is Ode to Zeke. O oh, breathing drum, O oh, cask of dark waters, O oh, decaying star, my barking heart, my breaking brother, what will seep into the space your body leaves? O oh, huge 18 muscled ears, oscillating ossicles and cochlea, your busy canals, now hollow caves of quiet. I have said your fur is black, but you are silvered, rhymed with frost. You are the new moon. You are light in the dark house. How long will I see your shadow? Oh, heavy hunk of existence. Oh, great flank I have rested my head upon when I was too weak for human touch. Sleep leading man, you debonair dog. How people on the avenue stopped to swoon. Oh, splaying legs once faster than rabbits, canines slashing flesh, urgent thug, unstoppable thrust. Oh, happy snapping at the wind. What do you remember now that you are a mudslide, glacier melting, cliff collapsing into the sea? I have memorized your milky breath, your ballet leaps and whirly gigging, your princely patience as the children dressed you, soccer Zeke in jersey and shorts, one paw on the ball, snorkel Zeke with mask and fins, bar mitzvah Zeke in a yarmulke and my father's silk tallit. Oh, my text of decrepitude, my usher to death, companion of 10,000 years. I'll fry you a fish. I'll sit by your bowl. Eat from my hand. I have nowhere to go. And I'll end with this last ode, Ode to the First Peach. Only one insect has feasted here. A clear stub of resin plugs the scar and the hollow where the stem was severed shines with juice, the fur still silvered like a call. Even in the next minute, the hairs will darken, turn more golden in my palm, heavier this flesh than you would imagine, like the sudden weight of a newborn. Oh, what a marriage of citron and blush. It could be a planet reflected through a hall of mirrors, or what a swan becomes when a fairy shoots it from the sky at dawn. At the beginning of the world, when the first dense pith was ravished and the stars were not yet lustrous coins fallen from the pocket of night, who could have dreamed this would be carried in the chaos, scent of morning and sugar, bruise and hunger? Silent, swollen, clefted life, remnant always remaking itself out of that first flaming brightness. Thank you. Oh, Ellen, master teacher and mentor and wise leader and friend. Thank you so much. So I am a proud primary sponsor of a dazzling soul, Panina, 
and our relationship through WhatsApp and so on has really been transformative. And I get to meet her in January with Kim. I'm so proud to be part of the She Fund. My relationship with the Maasai specifically goes back to when I was 19, 50 years ago. And I was almost killed by a rhino and they got me out of a jam. They had no idea who I was, but they pulled back their Maasai club and helped me out of a difficult situation. And since then, I've had the privilege of spending some time with the Maasai since that. And also, I have a daughter from East Africa who is now a, a beautiful grown woman who would have had the cut, the mutilation at seven, had I not adopted her. That was the tradition of her cry, tribe, the Garagi. So when Kim approached me with her project with the She Fund, I was so very privileged and happy. I'm now a board member as well as a primary sponsor. I'm a neurologist and a poet, and uh, I couldn't be more not only thrilled, but really my heart opened and transformed. This is a happiness. This is a small good thing with enormous implications, as you'll see from the next video from Lena, and it is about what we can do. These things that seem for us in our privileged world, most of our privileged worlds, perhaps a small gesture, but mag a magnificent one that is one of the few absolute goods I can think of in my world. So thank you, Kim, and thank you all of, all of those who work so hard to make these girls realize their dreams. And we'll hear now from Lena about the implications of the realization of her dream. So thank you again. When she came into my life, I saw that my dreams of becoming a better woman, a powerful woman in the community, a, a woman that come and transform the girls in our community, even in the nation. Now I, I can see dreams coming and coming and coming. Because she, the amazing thing to she, they provided to us that key of a brighter future to a, a Maasai lady, to a Maasai lady like me and other she students. Education is the key of everything. Education is the key of a brighter future. Education is the key of having a healthy life. Education is a key of even of eradicating poverty, eradicating even this incurring and circulation of retrogressive cultures of Maasai practices, like early marriages, female genital mutilation, FGM, that girls are every year, every year, every year they are going through. And many and thousand girls in our, in our communities are just, their dreams are just cut off. So she gave, uh, gave me that they pay all my school fees, Imagine paying all my, the school fees of the uh, university. Now I'm in Masai Mara University, taking uh, a degree in Bachelor of Commerce. Because through that education, I can give that back to my community. I can come back and give girls hope that it doesn't matter where you come from, your dreams are still valid. I have a dream, and a dream to transform, to transform the life of girls in our community. A dream that I will make girls to know the importance of education. A dream to fight against these progressive practices in our community, like FGM and early marriages. After I have now finished my studies, 
I'll come back to my community and stand for the girls. My message to the donors out there, you are just doing a great thing. You cannot even imagine how your money is transforming our lives. Thank you so much to she. You are just amazing. To all people working with she, you are just doing an amazing job. Thank you. God bless you all. I love you. Mwah, mwah, mwah. <laughs> it's my great pleasure now to introduce Janine Roth, who is not only the best-selling author of 10 books and a leader of profound and powerful workshops. I know firsthand she changed my life in one of them before we became friends. She is also my dear friend and companion in navigating soul and psyche on our Sunday walks together. Janine is one of the 40 primary funders who are the heartbeat of the She Fund. Dawn is another. Each primary funder commits to see one student through her schooling and most opt to be in WhatsApp and video contact with her and exchange stories and photos and they even send small gifts, small, when the She team goes to Kenya. But Janine is the only one who ever sent an entire box of keto-friendly, sugar-free, bulletproof chocolate bars. <laughs> I was so envious of Sylvia. Behind me is Sil Sylvia Terraro, who is studying fashion design, thanks to Janine and Matt, her husband. Sylvia is the first person in her village to go to college, a village where female genital mutilation and early forced childhood marriage is still practiced. Because of Sylvia's example, many families have vowed to find ways to educate their daughters. With the help of Janine and Matt, Sylvia is changing the world. Janine, welcome. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, thank you. I have been so moved this morning. I'm still actually a little teary, crying. Um, from the work, from Lena's story, from the lions, uh, uh, from the poems and from the effusion of beauty that this event has brought forth uh, from the work that you're doing, from Sylvia's story. I'm just moved. Uh, I am, uh, when Kim asked me to read something <laughs> of my work, <clears throat> told her, that I actually hadn't written a poem since the many, many, many classes I did with Ellen in 1978, uh, <laughs> nine and 80, the last poem of which was called, My Man Was Like an Old Volvo. And uh, that was about uh, <clears throat> uh, my unfortunate habit of getting broken men and tuning them up the last line was finely tuned for another hand. So I am thrilled to be here and also thrilled to be here from Hawaii where I have spent the last six weeks studying with a gorgeous teacher and also drenched in beauty every day, drenched and marinating in beauty and what it's like to remind my nervous system that it's okay to live without an infusion of fear every day based on the news. So there is relaxation and beauty. And I'm here to say that it's possible to remember what it's like to live without fear because I am despite and probably even more important because of the circumstances in the world. So. Here is the piece that Kim asked me to read. Night comes swiftly. It's called snorkeling in the night sky. Night comes swiftly like a great dark soft thing. And for most of my life, I've greeted it reluctantly. 
as if behind the darkness lurked terror and shattered hearts. My mother says, you are a fast napper from the day you were born. Other kids went down for two hours. You slept for 20 minutes and were up for the rest of the day. Even as an infant, I didn't want to surrender to that dark, soft thing. After an early menopause, I started waking up three, four, five times a night. At first, I tried natural remedies, melatonin, bioidentical hormones, cortisol adaptogens, then unnatural ones, drugs. But since I have a paradoxical reaction to drugs, Ambien kept me awake. And during the second week I took Ativan, the first week was heavenly, I developed suicidal proclivities and wanted to jump off a bridge. Then I downloaded sleep music, tried brain balancing techniques, listened to books on tape. Middlemarch and Pride and Prejudice are still my favorites. Also anything by Bill Bryson, except he makes me cackle, which wakes up my husband, which makes two of us awake at 3 a.m. Still, night after night, my eyes flew open like clockwork, and with them began the rattling of my mind and the descent into the catastrophic. The pain in my chest is congestive heart failure. I'm sure of it. The ugly. I've been married to the wrong person for 30 years. I know it. And the uglier. Was that noise a rapist? In her book, Marrow, Elizabeth Lesser calls this litany middle of the nightism. And she urges us not to believe any thoughts that occur between midnight and six in the morning. To that wise advice, I would add, and stop reading articles that tell you that not getting enough sleep can lead to Alzheimer's, ALS, and autoimmune disease, particularly if like me, you might be prone to hypochondria. A few months ago, after lying in bed like a pencil in a drawer for hours each night, trying desperately to be peaceful, and instead feeling insane and judgmental, after 40 years meditating, you still can't quiet your mind, I decided that if I couldn't sleep, I shouldn't sleep, and that there must be something I could do that didn't require putting on lights, because as every insomniac knows, you're supposed to turn down all lights at dusk and keep your bedroom cool and dark to facilitate ongoing melatonin release. I remembered an article in the New Yorker in which the author says that before the advent of electricity and artificial light, people didn't sleep through the night. They'd sleep when it got dark, sleep one. And after a few hours, they'd wake up, congregate in small groups, and chat convivially. Then they trundle off to their stacks of hay and revive themselves with more sleep, which was called sleep two. Visiting friends in the middle of the night, having tea, biscuits, and, chat, and a chat in flannel pajamas sounds quite civilized to me, like those newly emergent death cafes where, quote, strangers gather to eat cake, drink tea, and discuss death to help them make the most of their finite lives, end of quote. In a sleepless cafe, strangers could huddle together and discuss being awake in the middle of the night. But since I live in the forest half an hour away from any place where insomniacs might huddle, I decided to start my own nighttime ritual. Now, when my eyes fly open at three, I follow my breath from my toes to the top of my head and back again a few times. Then I do the four, seven, eight sleep breath count, four on the in breath, seven at the top of the breath, eight on the out breath. But if I'm still awake after 15 minutes, I slip into my bright pink slippers with the floppy felt turquoise flowers, pad into the dark hall, with my arms outstretched like a zombie so that I don't bang into walls and trip over chairs, inch my way to the back door, exchange the slippers for my black 
knee-high Wellingtons, which I placed by the door the night before, put on my husband's puffy orange Antarctica coat, and grope for the door. I step down. I look up. And just like that, I am in another world. The glittering bowl of the night sky is so vast that it seems as if I am upside down. Like the first time I went snorkeling and saw that the ocean had an underneath. Swaying anemones, knobs of rutulent coral, neon purple and green rainbow fish that must have been here all along. But because I never looked below the surface, I never knew. In the middle of the night, with that very first step, I feel as if I am snorkeling in the night sky, gliding around the stars, letting the consummate darkness penetrate my fevered mind. I can't believe that this underneath has been waiting for me all along. And if not exactly terrified of it, I've been highly suspicious of its secrets and vast mystery. An owl hoots. The sound ricochets against the trees between my thoughts. A mockingbird sings and the notes feel as if they are rising from my sternum. The wind chimes, the ones that according to the salesperson from whom we bought them have been tuned to amazing grace, rustle against each other like silver fluted bells. As my eyes adjust to the dark, I start walking, which feels like swimming. Outside is in, upside is down. The vastness in the sky and the space between my ribs and my chest and inside every cell is hollow and full, nothing and everything. I open my arms as wide as I can, as if I can scoop the stars like liquid mana into my throat, my chest, my, leg, my legs. Once, twice, three times, the arms open, scoop, take in the stars and the darkness that makes them visible, while the trees noble and immense bear witness to this exchange of liquid light. Drenched in silence now, my body moves back to the house, swims down the hallway, moves into bed, and dissolves like the space inside an anemone when it closes, like the deathless beauty of no me, no you, no world. Thank you. Oh, Janine, thank you for that transmission of, of beauty, the beauty that one doesn't have to be in Hawaii to <laughs> know with the, the peace that you remind me of. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and thank all of you who contribute to the mm -hmm. She College Fund. It's, she, it's just so moving and beautiful and helpful and transformative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now is a moment I've been waiting for, and I'm going to do my best not to burst into tears, um, being so moved to see almost my two Kenyan daughters on the screen they're going to be speaking in the gathering after this event um, and sharing their stories and how they know firsthand what going to college can do in Kenya. But I just wanted to introduce them to you, to let them wave at you. And um, I want to introduce Jacinta, who is in the glasses. And uh, if you've read Saved by a Poem, you've actually met both of them in the last chapter. Jacinta was the very first she student and she was also I think you have to get a little closer to your screen because you keep turning into giraffes. Um, she was also the first uh, she student, but she was also the one who stood in front of me 
and said that line that has pierced me for decades about Mary Oliver, which is how did she know that thing that can happen in a poem where kinship happens in the most unlikely circumstances. She is now head of the uh, Kenya um, she fund. She's the executive director there. I met Salula on my first visit to that safe house just after she was rescued at the age of eight from a marriage to a man in his 40s. She had always wanted to go to school and today she is a degree student at Daystar University. And uh, as I said, both of them will be speaking in the information session, which will probably be more like I was going to say 1245. It's probably going to be more like 1255 if you choose to stick around. Thank you both for being here from Kenya, where it is almost the middle of the night. I love you both so much. And now I hand it off to the incoming executive director, Sarah. Kambu to speak to you. Hello. I trust everyone is enjoying the program as much as I am. So many memorable moments to cherish. Um, truly, it has been a gift to us all. Very emotional at this moment. I thank everyone, the artists and, and the audience. I'm Sarah Kambu. I'm the incoming executive director for the She College Fund. I joined five months ago and I've been working alongside uh, Kim Rosen, you know, really soaking up the ethos and philosophy of the organization, <clears throat> excuse me, learning the ropes and um, discovering its magic. It has been a fantastic journey. My entire career for decades of my life has been dedicated to advancing all facets of women's and girls' empowerment. I've worked on education, health and well being, financial security, and I've traveled all over the world collaborating with public and private partners in Africa and South Asia. So please imagine my joy and delight when, as a rather weary, dusty world traveler, I discovered the She College Fund and Kim Rosen. What a tremendous mission. Sending deserving young Kenyan women who have had the courage to say no to harmful traditional practices like FGM and child marriage to college in Kenya. And we listen to Lena and the wisdom of Lena's words Without the She College Fund, these young women would not have an opportunity to go to college. They would not have an opportunity to better their own lives and the lives of their families. So this 40 year veteran of uh, women's and girls empowerment, there's two things I look for. Mission, tremendous mission. And I want real measurable, impact. 97% of the She Fund students complete their degree programs. Why are we so proud of their success? Because globally, the higher education completion rate for all students, men and women combined, is 67%. Our students are at 97%. Tremendous. And if we consider that in Kenya, 10% of all girls graduating from high school are able to enroll in higher education programs, that's extraordinary in and of itself. Very small number progressing on. One other impact indicator that I'd like to highlight, 70% of our graduates are working, using their income to change their lives and the lives of their family. As you can see, they are truly an inspiration to their community. Mission and impact. As I said earlier, the She College Fund is a gem of an organization. I'm very moved by today's program. Your presence and bearing witness here today, the gifts of poetry and music 
from our artists. The fact that we've now raised $22,000, which will send five young women to college in 2024, I thank you. But this is all testament to one woman who has a generous, ever-expanding heart and an untethered ability to dream. Kim Rosen. Friends, in my first official act as executive director, and on behalf of the board of directors, I have the distinct honor and privilege to announce the establishment of the Kim Rosen Scholarship Fund. This fund is designed to leverage the power of collective giving. All of us are stronger together. The fund will be officially launched next week on the She College Fund website. However, the board of directors has decided that all funds raised during today's event will go directly to the fund to honor the many gifts of Kim Rosen. So now I invite you all to participate in a very special fundraising challenge. If you appreciate Kim's vision of sponsoring courageous and resilient young women for college education, please make a gift of any size by clicking on the link in the chat. Let's honor Kim's legacy. Let's raise $4,000 in the next seven minutes while we're watching this video. May we send another young woman to college in Kenya, inshallah. And now, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce a woman who leads with her heart, her mind, and her spirit, the incomparable Kim Rosen. Oh my gosh, that fills me with tears and discomfort. And thank you, Sarah. Thank you, thank you for everything you're bringing, everything you're bringing, including the idea for this fund, which at first made me very uncomfortable. And yet I am deeply grateful to everyone who is a tributary into it. And most of all, that we will be able to send students to college through this fund who do not have primary funders. We've never been able to do that. We've had to say no to so many students because we didn't get enough primary funders to fund everybody, but now we hope we'll be able to. Years ago, when the SHE Fund was very young, we used, Annie Lightbody, who you'll meet soon, and I used to go to the V-Day safe house, the one safe house we were working with at the time, now we're working with five, um, we would go there every year and for a week we would rehearse with the girls there to help them to perform a poem about women's empowerment. We did poems by Maya Angelou, Malala, Mary Oliver. One year we decided to write our own poem based on their personal stories. And that is what you are about to see. Most of the girls in the poem who were in high school at the time are now college students in the SHE Fund, so I can't watch this film without weeping, uh, seeing, knowing where they've come to. The poem was written to be performed for girls, the girls of their culture, to teach them that they don't have to go through FGM and marriage to be a woman. This is the video of their performance of that poem, and it's followed by a slideshow which will give you time to make your donation. <laughs> And also uh, these images will show you where these young women come from, who they are now, and where they're passionate about going. It's about seven and a half minutes long, just enough time to meet Sarah's fundraising challenge. And the link is in the chat to donate and you can probably find a QR code on the screen as well to, um, to use your phone if you prefer. But one day, someone 
run away. Tomorrow at dawn is your circumcision day. For me, it was a preacher. He said, go while you can, or your daddy gonna sell you to that 40 years old man. My dad was a poor man. He couldn't feed the kids. He needed my dowry, but I ran and hid. My teacher told me that I was smart and good in school, but my father wouldn't let me go. He said that was the rule. School is for boys, they say. Class has no choice, they say. You have to be cut, they say. You must shut up, they say. You, you have, have to be married. There is no sense wishing. It's the only way to be a good, clean Christian. But the preacher said no. Your parents just haven't heard that female circumcision is not part of God's word. You don't need a car to have a good life. A girl who has three must say no to the night. To be a real woman and a good Christian too. Make an education and yourself be true. My mama says, when you finish your chores today, don't come back home. Take this money. Run away. My uncle gave some shillings to a person with a car who took me to the safe house. The journey was so far. The preacher took me to a man with a truck. The roads were so bad, we almost got stuck. I walked by myself. It was cold. The road was steep. I hid in the bushes and tried to go to sleep. An older boy took me on the back of his bike. It was raining. It was dark. There were ironers in the night. I was scared. I was strong. I was weak in my knees. I was shaking and breathless. But I had to believe. We made it to the safe house. And Mama welcome us. We got showers and clean clothes. And all the girls let us out. And all the girls showed me where to shower and where to eat. She gave me some clothes and showed me where to sleep. I started in class five. But now I'm in form three. I started in class two. It was hard to learn to read. I am the best in my class at science and at math. I am the head girl in my dorm and help the others do their task. Someday I'll go to college. Then I'll be a nurse. Then I'll be a poet and write my feelings into verse. I want to be a teacher, be a doctor. On a show, I want to be an activist and make the violence stop. My parents were so angry, but now we are reconciled. They come to me for advice. They are proud that I'm their child. Sometimes I miss my mama, but I know she's proud of me. She works so hard with all the kids. She wants me to be free. You two can do it. You are beautiful and smart. You have lips in your mind and love in your heart. So don't let people tell you you are bad or you are dumb. Be ready for the moment when you know your time has come. If I have the courage to save my own life, you too can do it. Don't get sold to be a wife. I am a powerful person and I will choose the man that I love. He will respect me and we will get married by the grace of God above. The first step can be scared. But God is on your side. Soon you'll be a smart lady and you'll walk with pride. You'll go to college, get a job, and save other girls. Help your, help your parents, have a family, and change the world. We are the girls who are changing history. We are the girls who demand equality. All over the world, girls are claiming their power. Will you join us? Make a difference. This is the hour. Touchant au
they amazing amazing annie it was so wonderful to watch your face because i know you know the story of every student on that slideshow yeah so we have raised four thousand and fifteen dollars in the last seven and a half minutes go team go Thank you. And another young woman will have the opportunity to go to college. Thank you, everyone, so very much. Our last poet is uh, Jane Hirschfield. And I want to introduce her by telling you a story of something that happened yesterday. Uh, people who know me know that I tend to get very anxious before big events like this, even though when they are happening, I'm in bliss. Um, and yesterday was a perfect day for anxiety, as you may imagine. So in the middle of my machinations, a poem spontaneously popped onto my computer screen and occluded all the documents I was so furtively working on. And it was Jane's poem, Each Morning Calls Us to Praise This World That Is Fleeting. I have no idea how it happened. It was pure miracle. So I decided to take it as a sign and instead of driving myself mad attempting perfection, I went for a walk and I learned the poem by heart. I tell you, that poem was like an ambulance from the planet of sanity. I recommend it highly. Inside it, I became human again and full of wonder and gratitude. And each of Jane's poems is like this for me, a portal into sanity and silence no matter what it seems to be about. Jane is a champion for our planet and the people of this planet. And she does this not through blame or drama, but by showing us our reflection in the mirror of true perception. Jane, you've supported the She College Fund since we began. And thank you, thank you, thank you for being here today. Oh, well, this has been <laughs> an undoing day and it was all I could do not to sob my way through the last seven minutes so thank you Kim thank you everyone um you know in in a times of catastrophe whether these are slow catastrophes or fast catastrophes we search for ways to serve we search for solace we search for company and 
every part of what we've seen today has proven that these things are possible, um, that it is possible to serve. It is possible to find the kinship of kindness. And it is also possible to do more. Um, so thank you, everyone, for doing more. I'm going to start with a poem um, called The Bowl. And you can think of it as any normal kitchen bowl. You can also think of it as the bowl that is our life, that is our day that holds everything. And you can also think of it, and the reason that I chose it to begin with, as the bowl which is carried by Buddhist monks when they go out every morning in traditional cultures from their monastery and go into the community with an empty bowl. And if they have served the community, they will be given food, and that is what they will eat that day. And I believe this giving bowl is what today is so much about. So the bowl. If meat is put into the bowl, meat is eaten. If rice is put into the bowl, it may be cooked. If a shoe is put into the bowl, the leather is chewed and chewed over a sentence that cannot be taken in or forgotten. A day, if a day could feel, must feel like a bowl. Wars, loves, trucks, betrayals, kindness, it eats them. Then the next day comes, spotless and hungry. The bowl cannot be thrown away. It cannot be broken. It is calm, uneclipsable, rindless, and big though it seems, fits exactly in two human hands. Hands with ten fingers, fifty-four bones, capacities strange to us, almost past measure. Scented, as the curve of the bowl is, with cardamom, star anise, long pepper, cinnamon, hyssop. I had already chosen this next poem before I heard Kim's introduction. Each morning holds to pray this world that is fleeting. Before dressing inside the not ever again. Under sunlight or cloud, brushing the hair. Not yet arrived at the end crimped finish, drinking coffee and buttering toast. Permitted to slip into coat, into shoes. I go out, I count myself part. Carrying only a weightless shadow whose each corner joins and departs from the shadows of others. Mortal, alive among others, equally fragile. And with luck, for days even sometimes, this luxury, this extra gift, able to even forget it. I open the window. What I wanted wasn't to let in the wetness. That can be mopped. Nor the cold. There are blankets. What I wanted was the siren, the thunder, the neighbor, the fireworks, the dog's bark. Which of them didn't matter? Yes, this world is perfect, all things as they are but I wanted not to be the one sleeping soundly on a soft pillow, clean sheets untroubled, dreaming there still might be time while this everywhere crying. This next one is a poem I wrote long ago on one of those days that seemed to have recurred over a lifetime when you just feel like, oh, there's nothing I can do, there's nothing I can do, but there's always something we can do. And, you know, the long ago uh, 
discovery of the butterfly effect that, you know, a butterfly can flap its wings on one continent and cause a hurricane on another. There is power in everything that our intention brings forward into this world. Changing everything, a modest little title. Changing everything. I was walking again in the woods. A yellow light was sifting all I saw. Willfully, with a cold heart, I took a stick, lifted it to the opposite side of the path. There, I said to myself, that's done now. Brushing one hand against the other to clean them of the tiny fragments of bark. Something we all need today more than ever, as much as ever, and have always needed. Optimism. More and more I have come to admire resilience. Not the simple resistance of a pillow, whose foam returns over and over to the same shape, but the sinuous tenacity of a tree. Finding the light newly blocked on one side, it turns in another. A blind intelligence, true, but out of such persistence arose turtles, rivers, mitochondria, figs. All this resinous, unretractable earth. I'm going to finish with a poem that all the years, the 40 years since I first wrote it, I introduced it as a poem of love and the end of love. But just in these past two weeks, I have begun sometimes reading it uh, with a different meaning. Um, a poem envisioning peace. For what binds us? There are names for what binds us. Strong forces, weak forces. Look around, you can see them. The skin that forms in a half empty cup. Nails rusting into the places they join. Joints dovetailed on their own weight the way things stay so solidly wherever they've been set down. And gravity, scientists say, is weak. And see how the flesh grows back across a wound with a great vehemence, more strong than the simple, untested surface before. There's a name for it on horses when it comes back darker, and raised, proud flesh, as all flesh is proud of its wounds, wears them as honors given out after battle, small triumphs pinned to the chest. And when two people have loved each other, see how it is like a scar between their bodies, stronger, darker, and proud, how the black cord makes of them a single fabric that nothing can mend or tear. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jane. Thank you. What a benediction to this celebration of kinship bound by scars that nothing can bend, can mend or tear. May it be so. Mm, thank you. I am thanking everyone here. I am hoping everyone is going to be visible in a moment on the screen just to say goodbye to all of you. Um, and I'm hoping that even as Kat spotlights everyone with one hand. She can open up the chat to anyone who wants to give us any kind of communication to the whole group. Um, my heart is full 
And for now, I invite you in a minute to join me in applauding wildly for these artists and the she team on the screen. Sarah Annie Lightbody, our Kenya USA program coordinator, Jacinta and Salula. I thank Sylvia Otieno and Don McGuire, who are there somewhere out there, I know, for bringing your passion and your wisdom here. And a huge shout out to Maya Brown. I don't know if you're still here, but thank you for all the graphics and everything else you did to lay the foundation of what happened here tonight. And finally, I hope for especially wild applause for Kat Weiss Malik, the techno magician behind all of this spotlighting and finagling and sending us news of what has been raised. So Kat, you are an earth angel for sure. Yes. Um, we're going to move into two separate groups after we have our moment of applause at the end. And I just want to be clear that those who would like to stay for an information session with Jacinta, Salula, Annie, Sarah, and me, um, please hang out here. And in a minute, amazingly, magically, those who are going to the patron reception with the artists are going to get an invitation into a breakout room. However, I've been told that many people did not put their full name on their uh, Zoom uh, picture, and without the full name, we don't know who you are. So there may be a few people who expect to get invitations who don't get it, and what's going to happen is that Annie and I are going to scramble for a few minutes. If you don't get an invitation, you can um put a note to us in the chat or just put a note in the chat and we tell us your name and what to look for and we will try to get you into that breakout room right before we start the information session but for now i want to ask everybody to unmute yourself cat should have given you the option to do that and i would like to just cheer wildly and somehow express the huge gratitude that we all have for everybody here Mama Katari, I think I'm here. 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 I